Let's hear it for the reviewer of the week. It is a hard one. It's Fish S B X K S N A I N A Z H Monger. So there's probably a way to say that, and I just didn't. So sorry about that. But this person says, she says, this podcast rocks. I love this podcast. The birth course and this podcast were so helpful for me when I was in my fourth pregnancy. I'm now in my fifth and catching up on all the episodes I missed while I wasn't pregnant. I love the practical advice for birth and the encouragement to have a plan and to listen to your body. All things I didn't really know with my first three births. This knowledge made all the difference with my fourth birth. I'm looking forward to all the knowledge I have yet to learn, even as a mom of almost five. I totally recommend this podcast and tell all my pregnant friends about it. Thank you, whoever you are. This is really awesome. And it's kind of one of my favorite things. I could not agree more. Like every pregnancy, I learned a little bit more and a little bit more until I was really comfortable with everything I knew. I feel like if I were to get pregnant again, I'd be doing it all over again. There's always more to learn. Um, So I love that those of you that are following along are here with your third, fourth, fifth pregnancies, um, maybe even more and enjoying the content. So Let's dive into this week's episode. Um, <clears throat> kind of a long intro, <laughs> I guess, before we get started. But here's the thing. I was thinking about it. And as I was writing all this stuff down, I'm like, this is just kind of how we've been. Maybe conditioned is the right word. But this is just how we've grown up here in the United States. And so maybe you heard me talk about this a little bit when I was talking about which providers you can have for your birth and and what each one does. And I kind of mentioned in that episode, I talked about obstetrics and obstetricians. And I said, from the time that we get our menstrual cycles, right, we go to an obstetrician um, or at least sometime af- like shortly after that. And when we go to an obstetrician, we get a vaginal exam, which is a probing into our most private and secluded areas. And nothing about that feels natural or normal at any age. And if it does for you, that's great. I would say the majority of women, and myself included, that's an, it is not natural. It's not normal. It's invasive. I don't like it. Now, oftentimes this professional is a male. However, sometimes it's female um, and people can have different ways or whatever about that where they like one or don't like the other or whatever. Um, But what happens during a vaginal exam, which those of you listening have probably had one, and so maybe this is a little more for your birth partner, but what happens is fingers are inserted into the vagina and there's some poking and prodding and probing around in there. And then there's also pressure, like them pushing on the lower abdomen during that exam against the fingers that are inside of the vagina, right? Why am I talking about all this? Just hold tight with me. Um, But then they use a tool on top of all that. They use a tool called a speculum. And the speculum is this, I want to say gun-shaped thing because I have three boys at home, you guys, but it's not like they're running around shooting each other with speculum. So stay with me here. But anyways, this thing is inserted into your vagina and there's like a crank or like they kind of squeeze on it and it opens the vagina so that they can stick a light down there and look in there and maybe even put stuff in there to test the cervix and whatever else. Anyways, this is our introduction to vaginal exams. And because it happens so young and, after, you know, we're young, we're impressionable, we're basically we grow up with it. So it's like this is the norm. Then it only seems natural when we become pregnant that people would need more time in that space because that's where a baby is going to come out of, right? I think a lot of times we don't even think to question it. And most times we certainly aren't given an option around it. It's more of like an, okay, it's time for, and now it's time for the vaginal exam. You know, you're there for your regular monthly, maybe if you're earlier in pregnancy or biweekly, if you're a little bit later in pregnancy, you're there for your regular checkup with your provider. And it's like, we're going to check the heart rate and we're going to do your urine sample. And all right, now go ahead and undress from the waist down and we'll do your vaginal exam. It's not like, and would you like to have a vaginal exam this time? It's not like that. And the same goes for birth. So we arrive at hospital in labor. The first thing that they do in order to admit anybody is, okay, let's make sure that we do a vaginal exam. They're going to check heart rate for mom and baby and all that kind of stuff too. But let's do a vaginal exam and make sure you're in quote unquote real labor, right? Uh, Which to them means dilation of at least four centimeters. 
Never mind that you can be completely dilated past four centimeters for four weeks or several weeks more um, prior to coming into labor. And then you can also be two centimeters and actively working through labor and ready to be like you're in transition 30 minutes later. But this is their standard that they use. And there's a whole other study and whole other thing. It's like this whole six centimeters is the new four. And so is four centimeters really active. There's like a whole controversy around that too. But basically when you come into labor or come into your birth space, they want to make sure mom is in labor. So let's do a vaginal exam. Okay, once we're admitted, the vaginal exams continue, right? Um, It's sometimes every hour. Uh, Sometimes you might get a little bit more of a space as things pick up. Sometimes it can be a couple an hour. I've seen it quite close together, like, oh, is she ready to push? Oh, is she ready for this? Oh, let me try another vaginal exam. And the thing is, they're often used by nurses and providers to gather information. They're trying to figure out where you're at in your labor and whether or not your body has quote unquote, stalled to a point of, quote, failure to progress. Okay, so what does this really mean? Other than if they decide that you are, in fact, failure to progress, that you'll be looking at a cascade of interventions possibly ending with cesarean birth. I'm glad you're here, and I hope that you want to know because that's exactly what I want to cover today. And I hope by the end of this episode, you're going to have a little more clarity behind your rights and your own decision behind whether or not you choose to use vaginal exams in this way to allow a provider to assess where exactly you are in your labor. So let's talk about the benefits of vaginal exams because maybe there are a few. When I originally started writing this, I put a big in caps, none. There's no benefits. I was so angry. (laughs) Um, But here's a benefit. It can tell you the direction of your baby. So for a mom who's maybe having sporadic contractions and back labor and things are progressing weird and she's like, please just check me, the nurse can say based off of the plates of baby's head, they can tell if they're good at it because they can get it wrong too like they did in my first birth, Um, but they can tell which direction baby is facing. And so if you have like a baby that's asynclitic or uh, you have a baby who is posterior or maybe, I don't know, just in all the different, if they're not like facing that normal direction, they can say, oh, they're doing this. Let's try and put your right leg up this time because we're going to twist baby. We're going to try and rotate them the rest of the way or allow that contraction to rotate them. So I found that as a use. Um, And you should know though, if they're looking for a direction of baby, that's going to happen only if your water is broken. If your water is intact, you're going to have a nice little cushion there that's not going to allow them to feel baby's head enough to be able to say what position is. And so if your water is bo- broken and you're having a vaginal exam, that can cause other issues, including vaginal infection, uterine infection. So keep that in mind. Now, if you're having increased dilation with each vaginal exam, it can be encouraging. So I'd say that is another benefit of vaginal exams. Maybe there's some other ones. Those are the two that I came up with while I was angrily writing none. So there it is. Let's talk about the risks involved with vaginal exams. Number one, they are uncomfortable. And I'm going to count that as a risk. They are painful, especially during labor. Um, For many, they're painful prior to labor. I'm one of those women. I had endometriosis. I didn't know what to call it, but I knew I could not have people with their hands up in my vaginal area, but I did it every year because I was supposed to get my annual and all the things. So endometriosis, or if you have fibroids or cysts, um, if you have a sensitive cervix, like there are reasons that it's not comfortable, but during labor while you're having contractions and that whole area, like it's more not comfortable. Um, And then it makes the next contractions that you have after that vaginal exam more painful. So that's like a heads up if you choose to have a vaginal exam during labor. They require you to be on your back most of the time. It is the most convenient position for your provider to check your cervix in. I want to be clear about that because I have seen providers do them in other positions like hands and knees and squatting. And the funny thing about that is that when you check dilation in different positions other than closed off with your back to the bed, uh, leaned back laying down, that dilation can change. And so that should tell you something too, that it's not a perfect measurement. It can be discouraging for mom to hear over and over every hour or however often she's being checked that there's still no change or in their case, maybe they're saying no progress. 
Um, it introduces bacteria into the vagina and the uterine area. Again, that can be worse if your waters are broken. A rough exam can actually break your bag of waters, which is awful. <laughs> I mean, it's not awful in the sense that like, oh, your water's broke, but like there's a little bit of cushion that happens and then it's that risk of infection that goes up if the bag of water breaks before it was ready to specifically. So keep that in mind. And then um, there's information about dilation, efface effacement, and station that can be used to term your labor failure to progress. So there's that information that they're getting from the vaginal exam that can be used in a way that is not the best for mom and baby. Let me talk a little bit about what failure to progress really is. And you can tell I'm a little lit up about this by how I typed this out, but this is true. Some of it is a little bit of my passion behind it, um, but the rest, it, it's true. And really the only thing that you need to know is the first one and it's failure to be patient on the part of the provider. Uh, but what other, what other things came up for me, which is also very true, is it's failure to allow a woman to trust in her body. It's failure to accept that natural stalls are actually a normal experience for birth. Um, natural stalls allow for readjustment for baby, adjustment for mom. They allow rest time for mom. I think it's a failure to do no harm because once we start telling a woman that her body is not working the way that it's supposed to, um, not only does that cause psychological, mental damage for mom, even emotional damage for mom, you know, my body isn't working. I'm not made to make babies and something is wrong with me. I just couldn't dilate past this. I, anyways, it puts this weight on mom that something is wrong with her. And I think that falls into the, you were supposed to do no harm. Anyways, a failure. And I think it's a failure on the part of the provider, not the birthing mother. I want to be really clear about that when they say failure to progress. The other thing about it is it's very, very subjective. So in other words, one provider could call failure to progress at a very different time and space than another provider would call for the same birthing woman or for different birthing women. So there's nothing that says this is markedly failure to progress because mom has hit all of these parameters, which would kind of be a joke anyways, because if you have ever been at a series of births, you know that no one birth is going to progress exactly the same as another one. So it's just silly to kind of put everybody on the same scale. Let's talk about, though, other ways to measure where a woman is at in labor, because I know maybe some of you are wondering, and it's a fair question, okay, well, if they don't do vaginal exams and I don't want vaginal exams, how are we going to know, like, where I'm at in labor and, like, if this is safe for me and baby? Those are reasonable questions to have, and I definitely want to um, address those. So number one, you pay attention to the mom. Um, what's her attitude? Like what noises is she making? Where's her focus? Is she having to focus? Watch the movement of her body. Um, just paying attention to mom will give you way more information about where a mom is at in labor than having a vaginal exam. Um, I, I can't even tell you like the number of births that I've been at. I'm like, I don't need a vaginal exam to know where she is. And sometimes that vaginal exam, even because I can't help but like guess like, oh, I bet she, maybe she's around this many centimeters, you know, just for fun, trying to see what they're going to say. And they can, it can be so off. And I'm like looking at her, I'm like, there's no way that, I mean, they're telling me she's like early, early active labor. And I'm like watching her I'm like, I, okay, your dilation says that. Look at what mom is doing. No, <laughs> like she's working it. She is an active labor. I don't care about the dilation anyways. So, uh, and then there's the physical waste. So maybe some of you have heard of the purple line. So our bodies do really need things. Um, you don't always see this with every mom for sure, but the purple line is this line that occurs. They say it kind of happens between zero to centimeters when labor is getting going and it starts kind of, um, crack of your bum <laughs> towards your perineum and it works its way up towards your lower back. And so when it reaches the top of your bum crack at your lower back, that means, or they say, we think that's like full dilation. So there's other things that tell us where mom is at. Even physical things that they can use as guideposts. And then there's the rhombus of my 
I always want to say Michaelis, but I think it's Michaelis. And it's part of the lower spine that actually spreads and moves to make room for baby. And so when a mom is getting closer to pushing stage, and there's definitely been some pictures on social media about this recently, which they've been excellent, excellent pictures for visualization. Um, But it looks like a large bump. It almost looks like kind of like the baby's head, which that's not exactly what it is. But it looks like the baby's head is like just at the base of mom's lower back. Um, So kind of just makes this like big round and you're like, yes, something is planning to come through the vagina soon, (laughs) you know, like there's it, but it's really neat. Our body is amazing. And so it's doing all kinds of things in there to, to make space and allow baby to be able to move and work through the pelvic area. So those are a couple of things. The other things that I will tell you from being a doula, so this is something that a birth partner can absolutely catch on to when the hands-on techniques start to move lower. So a lot of times when I'm doing counter pressure on a mom that is in labor, um, we start up higher on the hips and I have, you know, the palm of my hands on either side of the hip and I am squeezing hard, squeezing those hips together. What happens is as that baby moves lower, the pressure that she needs moves lower too. Like your hands start to move lower until you are just down towards her bum. Um, And so you can tell that way. Like clearly baby's making their way lower. And as a baby goes lower, the cervix dilates and all that stuff. So it's all part of it. You may start having to support counter pressure without leaving anywhere as the birth progresses, whereas like you do counter pressure for a little and you try something else and she change positions and you take a break and go get something to eat. It's like, oh, all of a sudden I have to be here at all times and my arms are killing me and I'm going to be doing this for another six hours, right? So mom needs that support longer than constant. Um, You might notice mom is getting shaky and she's burping and she vomits. Those are signs of transition. In other words, there are physical signs that exist as mom moves through labor. Um, Same with getting hot and cold, sweating and freezing, um, needing cool rags, wanting warm socks. All of that is just progress of labor. And then pay attention too to how she's like swaying with her body and changing positions and grunting or moaning. Uh, all of that shows progress much more than a vaginal exam ever will. Now, because I talked about natural stalls, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So if you are a member of the birth course, there's an entire section that we go over that talks about natural stalls, when they occur, why it's normal, all of that stuff. If you're not a member of the birth course, go join it. But I'm also going to teach you about natural stalls right here. So, um, and not as detailed, but I want I just want to make sure that Those of you that are listening understand that it's a really normal occurrence when it is treated that way. So bodies go through periods of activity and periods of rest, just like in normal life, just like your everyday, whatever you're doing, like there are periods where you're walking around, there's periods where you're resting. It's the same with labor. Uh, And for some people, you know, some people you're not going to get that break. It's going to progress really quick. It's going to be this kind of whatever thing. And then it's interesting, like even when you get to pushing though, like transition is so hard. It's like that final stretch and then pushing like things spread out and you get a chance to breathe and you get sometimes even a nap in between contractions, like your body is smart. But I want to be clear that a lot can be happening when contractions slow or stop. Um, Some of that might be with dilation, not increasing. And so, you know, there's, like I said, mother nature is smart and birth is hard work and there's positioning that can be happening with baby. Maybe your body's creating hormones or getting the breasts ready for once they're born. Like there are other things happening that we don't see and we can't measure um, by being inside of the body. So I think it's really important to just say like, it's not always go, go, go with labor and that's okay. Like it's normal. So when you have these natural stalls, when you have um, a period where your body chills out a little bit, where contractions slow down or stop, it's actually really normal for labor if it's treated that way. Let me tell you a little experience with my third baby. So first of all, I was a VBAC mom, right? So vaginal birth after cesarean, that was my number two. My first baby was a cesarean. Second baby was a vaginal birth after cesarean with an epidural. My third baby, I was working at birthing that baby at home. I had prodromal labor for a week. I had contractions that were sporadic, and then they were never closer than about six minutes apart my entire labor. Uh, That included transition. I had around 24 hours of active labor. 
And after about a day's worth of labor, I'm going to say maybe 12 to 18 hours of that time of labor, I was exhausted and I said, I'm, I need to go lay down in my bed upstairs. So I did where I slept for 45 minutes. I had three contractions during that time. So they were about 15 minutes apart. And that third contraction that I woke up to, I woke up in transition. Um, and I, and then I went on to push for four and a half hours and I gave birth to my baby. If I was at a hospital, I a hundred percent would have had another cesarean period. I know that that's true. I know it's true because I had, had talked to that specific, like for sure at that specific hospital, that would have been my birth story. Um, they were already telling me we don't do that here. And then they said, well, we're really excited about you. When I had called back, we're really excited to try, you know, and I'm like, I am not going to be your experiment when I, when things don't go to plan because my labors never do. Um, so all of those markers, those common markers that are used in labor, in a birth space like that, I wouldn't have been hitting them correctly. My, you know, contractions are too far apart. We probably need to get Pitocin and see if we can amp things up. You know, you're stalling out. We probably need to get Pitocin and make sure that things continue. I can just see it all in the cascade. But because I was supported and not, I was supported, not allowed. I was supported during that time. I gave birth to my biggest baby, a healthy baby boy. He was almost eight pounds. He was like seven pounds, 14 ounces. Um, he had excellent APGAR scores. Uh, it was the most incredible, hands down, most incredible experience of my life. It is why I do what I do today. That birth changed everything. I wouldn't have had that experience uh, otherwise. I had a vaginal birth. I had no tearing. I walked up to my bed afterwards. We were downstairs. I walked upstairs to my bed afterward. I did not have a cesarean birth. And I just want to reiterate how important hearing an experience like that is. It's crucial for moms to trust their bodies, to trust the process. Like I've said it before. I will say it a million times again. You were born with a uterus. If you were a woman, you have a uterus. Like we literally are created. Our, our bodies are made to be able to grow, nourish, and birth our babies. And that's without medical intervention. And that's without people being all up in our business and throwing off the physiological nature of birth. Are there times where it's appropriate and we're grateful for medical things? Yes, absolutely. But I want to be really clear that birth is not an emergency. And if you haven't heard that before, hear it here, hear it again. Birth is not an emergency. A provider should be acting in the capacity of more of like a lifeguard. Like in, you're swimming, swimming's normal, you're good at it, you're made for it. If you get into trouble, I'm going to jump in and make sure that you're doing okay. It's more of that gentle capacity of I'm not going to control this or try to, to do anything specific with it to meet my standards. I'm just here if you need me. That's what a provider should be. I'll tell you as a doula, I've seen natural stalls. They're normal when they're allowed to be. I know I've said that a couple times. I will say this too, and nothing against hospital births, and I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do if this is your experience during a hospital, like if you're in a hospital setting. But uh, every time I have seen natural stalls that have been a decent amount of time and allowed to be what they are, it has been in a out-of-hospital setting. So that is not to say that these normal natural things can exist in a hospital setting. I'm just saying my experience, my personal experience has been this. So of course, I'm going to tell you, make sure that you're checking out your hospitals. Make sure that you're having this conversation with your provider. I'm going to give you that information in just a second. But that has been my experience. But I want you to know that natural stalls are just that. They are natural. They are normal. Now, do labors stall to a point of no return? Or in other words, what inhibits progression? What is it sometimes that can make this happen to where uh, no matter what, like now things have been stalled so long or in such a way that baby's heart rate isn't doing well or there's other issues going on, like what gets us to that point to where we have to involve other interventions and a possible cesarean birth? Um, number one, I would say environments that are not conducive to relaxation. So this is going to be um, whether whatever your birth space is. If it's like bright lights, unfamiliar distracting noises, unfamiliar distracting smells, unfamiliar unsupportive people, 
all of that is going to say, I'm not feeling so relaxed right now, right? And it gets mom stuck in this kind of fight or flight mode. Uh, I think, too, being told that there's something wrong with your body. So I kind of went over a couple of those before, but like, oh, you're not progressing or, oh, maybe you need some help. It just like it gets in your head, especially when you're in labor land and you're super vulnerable and you're like thinking, oh, like maybe I'm not made for this. Maybe I can't do this. And even if you were in a really good space before just working through it, that thought comes in and all of a sudden your body reacts to it. That's very real. Uh, so being told there's something wrong with your body, preparing a woman to trust in medication and her provider rather than having her be a part of the healthcare and birth process. Think about that for a moment, preparing a woman to trust in medication and her provider rather than being a part of the healthcare process herself and trusting in the birthing process. In other words, not preparing her for birth, right? If you are seeing your provider and you've talked to the hospital and whatever else, you have no idea about how the process of birth works, how to work with your body, like what the sensations are, how to work through hard things. Uh, you're going to end up in an unfair advantage if like the only thing that they're offering is, oh, well, are you ready for your epidural? Which if you want an epidural, like I've said before, I think that's great. There's a time and place for that. Um, and one of those is if you just choose, you want an epidural. But if you're being only offered that and not told that you're strong enough to make it through some of these contractions and if you wait a little bit longer that there's actually less chance of intervention and just that you're given those options, I think that's really unfair. Uh, it also puts mom in a position to not only like, you know, not know how to work with her herself, but those things naturally lead to um, things that cause more intervention and cesarean birth. So how to work through contractions is really important. I kind of just talked about that, but understanding like how a contraction works, how to breathe through them, that they ebb and flow, that they're going to get longer, stronger, closer together, all that kind of stuff, like different positions you can use, counter pressure techniques for birth partner, all the stuff that moms deserve to have. And then it's, I think too, like what options will be available to her and being given a choice. So part of what I think preparation should be is that understanding what could happen during birth and what the options would be at different stages. For example, they probably aren't going to, your provider is probably not going to bring up on their own. So in case we have a stall, you know, that's not a topic of conversation they're going to bring up with you on their own. That's something that you have to bring up with your provider, which I hope you do prior to being in labor. Um, and then in general, like just feeling like maybe mom feels like she doesn't have a say because she's not being given one, right? So a lot of the language is this is happening, so we're going to do this, not this is happening, this is what we're noticing, this is what it means, here are your choices, which one would you like? Because it doesn't have to be just this one way. An epidural is another thing that can kind of cause some of these stalls. One of the reasons for that is because when you get an epidural, you're required to stay in the bed. And so whereas a natural stall in a in a birth where you're able to get up and move around and listen to your body and move your hips and that kind of stuff, be in different positions, then when that exhaustion comes or your body says, you know, we need a break, then we take the break. With an epidural, your body is in constant break, except not really, right? Like you don't feel it. You can't move those things. But that Pitocin and stuff is still moving and going. And um, so – but just being in that, that it's why it's so important. If you have an epidural, that's great. You have to make sure to keep rotations. So um, lean left, you know, left side and use a peanut ball. Lean right side and use a peanut ball. Um, do the flying cowgirl, like where you've got the peanut ball and your legs are behind you, your knees are behind your hips. Uh, there's different positions and things that you can utilize, but Oftentimes because moms are left in that like leaned back position, which doesn't allow for a pelvis to be very open or a baby to really um, work their descent and not always, but sometimes it can be the case, then um, you want to make sure that you're utilizing the, those positions because otherwise, yes, it can lead to like, a OK, like nothing is happening here. And now we've got a baby in distress because we've got Pitocin going. So they're having all these contractions, but we're not seeing the progress. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. But epidural is something that could um, cause that issue. And so that's why we say, too, if you're able to work through labor for a little bit longer and get that epidural a little bit later in your labor, then that might be a little more positive for you to have less intervention. Now, I want to touch on, too, kind of how do we solve the problem or what can we do, <laughs> right? Because um, we're talking about vaginal exams. We're talking about people saying your failure to progress. Um, I, I like the title of this, like the lie, right? Like, ah, it's like not – 
it's like I said, it being subjective and stuff. So what can you do? So like I said, one of the options is to have an out of hospital birth, um, hiring a midwife that that sees birth as normal, physiological, non-emergent. And that would be the same if you're in a hospital with an OB, like finding somebody who's really supportive of labor just takes what it takes and you can do hard things and your body's made for this. That's the kind of conversation that should be happening. Uh, you can always seek other care if it, you know, I mean, not during labor. So this is something we want to take care of prior. You actually can. Did you know you can fire your provider during labor. I don't know if we should be getting into this, but you can. Now, if you're planning to give birth in a hospital, which I know the majority of listeners probably are, uh, here's what you can do. Number one, you want to be really vigilant. I guess that should be number two because number one is going to be your provider, right? But um, be vigilant, be prepared, do what you can to get the knowledge and information and all that stuff prior to labor so that you know how to work with your body and such. I'd say talk to your provider before you're in labor about how they handle um, or what they do with natural stalls. Ask them about failure to progress. Do you have any clients that have done this? Like, what does that look like? Um, what do you consider failure to progress or how long a labor goes before you require or or think that it's time for other interventions? Those are good questions. And then I think hiring a doula can be really, really excellent. It's so helpful to have somebody supportive in your ear. Like even if that is the sole purpose of having that doula there, just to say like, you're doing great. It's normal. You're fine. Um, I can't tell you the difference that made even in my third birth where I was like, I would start questioning something and just to have the midwife or the doula or someone in my birth space say like, you're doing great. Yeah, you're right where you're supposed to be. And I'd be like, okay, I can do this a little bit longer, you know? It makes a huge difference. Um, being prepared and knowing how to work with your body at home, obviously. Coming into your hospital later in labor. And I would say birth space. Like it doesn't even have to be hospital. If you are birthing in a birth center, um, you're just going to, I think, if you're looking to not have to deal with any of the like stalling and failure to progress stuff, um, come into the hospital later in labor. So that's like contractions are really strong. Like we've talked about before, the 311 for first time moms, maybe 411 for a second, but three minutes apart, lasting a minute long for at least an hour. Um, contractions are getting longer, stronger, closer together. They're kind of commanding your attention. You have to breathe and focus through them. Maybe you need some physical support. Uh, it should be like you are for sure in labor. There's no guessing. You know that this is the time. Then you can leave for your hospital. And of course, depending on how far you are from your birthplace and things, you can decide that on your own. You can deny or limit vaginal exams. They are not required. I probably should have said this at the beginning of the episode. Vaginal exams are not required. You can deny them at any point, and that includes yes on your way into the hospital. So they will tell you, well, we at least have to do this one to make sure you're in labor. No, you don't. That is actually your body, and there's no requirement saying that they have to physically be able to touch you for you to be able to get into that hospital. They can't deny a woman that is in labor from entering the hospital. Um, they have to treat it immediately. It doesn't even have to be the hospital that you were planning to give birth at. So they do not need to do a vaginal exam on your way in. Should you choose to do the vaginal exam or have the vaginal exam, that's great. That's your choice. Same with during labor, same with prior to labor but you do not have to do it. I would say have your birth partner stand as your guard, <laughs> kind of be that protector. Um, I like the idea of like keeping earbuds in and like I'm just going to ignore the negative things that people are saying if there's any negativity here. Um, and that can be like, oh, you're not progressing or your body is stalling or you're putting your baby in danger. That's one that drives me nuts because unless you are actually putting your baby in danger, which you've, you are birthing your baby, you are trying to get them out safely. I don't know. I That's one of the least favorite things I ever like hearing, obviously. Um, or, you know, this is a really common one and this one kind of gets me too, but it's the, you might just be someone that needs a little help. So, you know, like just try the epidural. Let's just try the Pitocin. Let's, let's give the forceps a chance and, um, or whatever other intervention. And it's like, oh, like a mom hearing that is just, it's like this defeating, okay, let's try that. Anyways, all right, you guys, that was like a lot of information about vaginal exams and failure to progress. And I hope you got a little bit about natural stalls too. Overall, what I think I want to like drive home here is 
vaginal exams are not a like absolute way to determine where you are at in your labor progression. They are one of many tools that could possibly be used. And there is a risk that if you are having vaginal exams during labor and a provider or nurse is not seeing a certain amount of dilation in a certain amount of time that they have assessed to be appropriate for your body to give labor, that it could lead to the possibility of other interventions. So if you are, even if you are at a hospital or with a provider, maybe this is just your situation where these people are are a little more pushy about it. So exa- example is like, they come in and are like, you know, we, we really need to assess where you're at. I can tell that whatever, whatever, but you're still in labor and let's see if, um, and you're just saying, no, I don't need a vaginal exam. Thank you. No. And they get a little more pushy. You know, like you can tell if you have this vaginal exam and things are not where they want it to be that you're going to have some other issues. It's so interesting watching like they can't do anything (laughs) it's like at that point it's like unless mom asks for something if mom and baby are doing fine like there's they they're kind of stuck there's no such thing as failure to progress at that point like they you know there's no marker that they can use if mom is still alive and awake and alert and doing okay and so is baby like at that point that's what they have to go off of and I kind of love that so whatever you do Vaginal exams are 100% your choice. Like I said, it can be encouraging. You could just be curious. It's okay to have them. Uh, I just want you to understand what can come from them, good and bad, and that you get to choose whether or not you have that vaginal exam. So I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode and I will see you next week.